So welcome everyone. It's good to see you. You have noticed it's very important when you practice meditation technique to practice properly, to pay attention to details, to proceed very carefully and slowly, to notice how you react to each step and how you actually work yourself through this technique. Some people tend to do this very aggressively in the beginning. I try to get something, I try to get it done, I try to become very focused and concentrated. And then usually at some point, after having banged your head against the wall for a good while, you will notice that it doesn't work, it doesn't help you to actually relax deeper. And we usually try a different way, and become more soft in our approach, and so forth. It's a learning path, and you learn through your suffering. You learn through the way you create stress for yourself. By looking through that, by seeing it, by observing it, by keeping an eye on yourself, you can learn a lot. And you can learn particularly in the two main areas of life that are most important to every living being, which is trying to be happy and trying not to suffer, actually. That's what we're all busy to accomplish. All human endeavors are for that sake. We try to be comfortable and at ease and happy and peaceful. We try to avoid suffering and stress and illness and all that. If you look at human history, you will see that we keep repeating the same kind of dramas and same kind of mistakes over and over again. And we don't only do this throughout thousands of years as the human race as a whole, but we do this within ourselves on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, in exactly the same way. We're approaching ourselves as something to be managed, to be changed, to be kind of fixed, maybe. And this is not kind. This is not forgiving. It's based on basically our upbringing most of the time. If we come from cultures where we learn that you have to perform in order to be loved, you have to um, show results so you get respect and attention from other people, then sure, then this is the same thing we do in meditation practice as well. We try to perform and we try to achieve and attain results, and we usually do this quite harshly because it comes from fear. The fear that if I don't make it, I will not be loved, I will not be accepted, and so forth. Many people in the beginning they actually practice for their teachers, or they practice for their system, their groups, their peers, people they hang out with. They try to look better in life when they practice meditation, they look more cool, they look more relaxed. Same reason, right? You want to be loved by your peers, you want to be accepted and, and seen. And after a while of doing that, then you will notice, oh, that's what I'm doing. It's called sincerity. You clearly understand what you're doing with yourself, where your limits are. You learn to respect them, you learn to work through them, gently, kindly, taking your time. So this is really important. This is the practice today was very simple very rudimentary, nothing much, nothing fancy going on, not many steps to remember, just simply being with your breath. And then the mind wanders off and then you bring it back to the breath. And then the mind wanders off again and then you bring it back to the breath again. Right? And many people, they do it like this. The mind wanders off, okay, I bring it back to the breath. Oh, the mind wanders off again, okay, I bring it back to the breath. The mind wanders off again. <clears throat> okay, I'll bring it back to the breath. And so that goes up until a raging point. It's like, damn it, I'm too distracted for this meditation thing. I'm not good at meditation. I can't do this. Here's where you need more kindness and understanding that every process in life is not just uh, you push a button and then you're enlightened and everything is smooth. Even though that's what we want, we want basically results without any effort. It doesn't work like that. But it's in the small steps, and every time you bring your attention to the breath, you remember the breath, that is called mindfulness. The word mindfulness in Pali is called sati. Sati means translated remembrance. You remember your object. 
That's one thing that you train. Each time you bring your mind back to your breath, you train remembrance, you train mindfulness. But that's not all. Once you come to your object, you want to stay with your object. That's another training. That's another facet of the mind that's operative here. The ability to keep something in mind, to dwell on the breath, to stay there, not to just immediately lose it again. As for many beginners, the case. You come to the breath, boop, you bounce right off, you lose it again. Mind goes shopping again. So instead, you want to come to the breath and stay with the breath. Stay, stay, stay. And then the third thing that we train is noticing when the mind wanders off. For a beginner, that's much like you notice it after 10 minutes of shopping. And then you're like, oh, oh, wow, my legs are crossed. I'm in a room with other people. I'm supposed to meditate. You totally forgot. Ah, there was a thing like the breath. What happens then? You remember the breath again. Mindfulness kicks in again. And every one of those three steps is a proper training. Whether it is the mindfulness of bringing your attention to the breath, the, the faculty of memory, of retaining of keeping the breath in mind and um, noticing when the mind wanders off. All these three steps are important. And you just repeat them. They're like push-ups. You don't feel frustrated after the second push-up. What? Up again? And then down again? What? You do it because up and down gives you a certain result, right? You do it for, let's say, the beach body. You want to have the beach body. so. You do the push-ups happily because you think this is the cause of a beach body. You want to do the meditation in the same way happily because it's the cause for happiness. It's the cause for relaxation and rest, health in the body and in the mind. So this is just a short uh, kind of talk about what we just did in the meditation practice. But the, the actual topic for today and for this week is about adjusting or um, training, cultivating ourself, choosing ourself. And in, in the frame of that today, we talk a little bit about how to overcome limiting beliefs. So that's today's topic. So all of us have some limited or limiting beliefs that hold us back from being good at what we want to be good at. Let's say, for example, you want to meditate. But it doesn't really work. It's because there are limiting beliefs. And they can exist on various levels. They can be very conscious, such as uh, every time when I mingle with other people, I feel anxious. Or I feel very self-conscious in a bad way. So th this belief then fulfills its function. Each time you meet a lot of people and you sit together with a lot of people or you have to speak publicly or something like that, then that belief kicks in and it fulfills its function. It wants to be valid, it wants to stay alive, it wants to be there. And that's a very conscious kind of limiting belief. I'm not good enough. Um, I'm probably not worth it anyways. Or I can't probably do this anyways. It's basically limiting beliefs are everywhere in your life where you actually want something but your mind talks in the opposite way. That's a conscious limiting belief. It talks you out of what you want. You're basically talking in favor of the obstacles. You're talking in favor of the, the inability. I can't. And you argue for that. Okay, I can't because. My memory is weak because. A, B, C, D. Instead of... How can I make my memory stronger? That's a bit more empowering. I'm not saying completely say that, you do, no, no, I'm, I'm not having a weak memory at all. My memory is superb. It's the best memory of the world. That's not what I'm saying. You don't want to create a fake image on top of the actual problem. Yeah. <coughs> Like when your wife is angry at you and you say, oh, that's probably because I'm awesome. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. 
but we do this in, in, in many different ways. We, we just talk it nice. We ignore the actual problem at the core of our experience. And we're very skilled at that. We don't want to look bad in any way. We don't really want to acknowledge, ah, oh, yeah, here's something I could improve or work on. That's important. So you want to recognize a limiting belief and see, yes, it points maybe to an actual fact, but maybe not. And for most limiting beliefs, they're very flexible and they're not actually the truth. They're just a, a limiting belief. But they fulfill their function so powerfully that they turn into a truth. They turn into a living experience, an actual experience in our life. Even though it's just a belief, it causes action, it causes reactions. It causes the way you feel and you move around in this world. It causes an experience of life which is in accordance with that belief. That's why it has to be looked in deeper. So the first thing is to really make it conscious. That's the first step. Make it conscious. How to make it conscious? It's simple ways to sit down and write it down if you like. Actually put a blank piece of paper in front of you and don't get up before you have really formulated what is it that holds me back in my life. I actually want to accomplish something, but I can't. Why? Well, because I feel it's too big for me. Why? And it maybe boils down to fear. Because I'm actually scared of the scale of the project or whatever that is, right? You might be scared of the scale, you might be scared of not making it, you might be scared of just human interaction, or maybe on a deeper level even scared of your own power, of yourself. Many people are actually scared of their own power without even noticing it. Because the, the mind is incredibly creative. So far it has created this personality, you. And it keeps that alive. And it adds on to it and it takes away from it occasionally. But you are continuously recreating yourself, moment after moment. It's just a problem for most people because they keep recreating things that, doesn't, that don't work for them. They just keep dwelling on thought patterns and belief systems and, and emotional structures that don't really work for them. They don't get them to where they want to be. So it's really important to recognize these. If you really want to improve your life, if you want to get better at something, then you need to know what's holding you back. And it always is in your mind. It's never an outer obstacle. Sometimes you might have to change course. You might have to change your ideas. You might have to change the way you approach it. But it always comes from the inside. It's this, this inner perception of the circumstance that doesn't allow you to progress. It's a, it's a perception. And these can be very strong because we usually consider our perceptions to be the truth. Our opinions to be the truth, whether they're about ourselves or other people or the world in general. What I think about it is the truth. That's the way it is. Don't you see how true this is? And then we argue with one another very often it's about, about our opinions and views. Can't you understand this? Let me explain it again to you. <laughs> and the other person is just equally as right. And equally as... But don't you get it? No, I get your point, I get it, but and both are right, both parties are right, they feel right, they feel empowered by their beliefs. So make the belief conscious, step number one. Write it down or sit with it. How to sit with your beliefs, with your limiting beliefs. First of all, you notice them by the way you feel, by the way they make you feel. Let's say you have a task ahead that you want to finish or you something a goal that you want to achieve 
Now, how do you feel about this? What's your feeling about this goal? Picture yourself achieving it. Feel that you're achieving it. And very often this comes with some limiting emotions about it. Something that holds you back, that doesn't allow you to make action, to take action now, to move forward now, to, to achieve something small now that gets you closer to that. Ah, you postpone it. It's like, okay, I'll start next week. Uh, oh yeah, New Year 2018 is soon, so that's a good way to start. I should start then. Like we postpone things and stuff. That points to limiting beliefs. It points to maybe a fear that you can't do it and so forth. Then sit with that until you feel the underlying fear. And then listen to it and allow it to formulate a sentence. Put it on a piece of paper. Very often, if you listen to yourself, you can put your hand on your heart and you can ask your heart for guidance. It talks. It talks to you in the form of thoughts. You ask a question and boop, the first thought that comes up can be the answer. Then you ask another question and boop, the first thought that comes up is the next answer. The beginning, some of the thoughts might not really make sense because often our subconscious mind speaks in a symbolic kind of language, almost like dreams. But you can ask yourself questions. I've been referring to that before. If you are a lucid dreamer, you can ask your lucid in, in your lucid dreams, you can ask your dream questions. This is even more powerful. You can invite your limiting beliefs in a lucid dream and they will appear as people, monsters, whatever. They will appear right in front of you and then you can talk with them. You can engage them. You can ask them where they come from and what their function is and what they need. What they need to dissolve. And you can do that in a much weaker level, just sitting quietly, reflecting on the way you feel about a certain belief that you have about yourself or your project or other people. That's first step. Second step then is to recognize that this is a belief that you have. That's important such an obvious step but it's really important to recognize ah, this is a belief like it's the same thing with thoughts if you recognize that thoughts run through your head to recognize them ah thinking that's just thinking instead of being hopelessly lost in your thoughts or feeling as if you were the thinker you can realize them as ah, just conditions in the head just a head movie running. It's just running. The same is true for beliefs. It's just a belief. It's not the truth. It's just something that you have learned to think about a particular situation or a particular ability that you have. And you have learned that and you have taken it on board and then kind of fixated on it for a little while. So it became a part of you over the years or the months. So we need to learn to really discern, ah, this is, a this is a belief, or this is a thought, or this is just a feeling. It's not actually true. It's just one perspective out of unlimited possible perspectives. And stay there until it clicks, until you really feel Oh, yeah, yeah, it's really just a belief. It's just a belief. I have to kind of hit you. Does it really sink in? That's already very liberating. You notice, wow, this is, yeah, it's just a thought formation. It's just mental fabrication. It's just a concoction in my head. It's not really anything that has any substantial reality to itself. It's just a product of circumstances, of upbringing, of learning, etc. It's not an ultimate reality. And then the third step is to challenge this belief with the opposite, maybe. If you feel like, oh, I can't, on the most simple level, I can't do this. Try how it feels like to see yourself in the position where you can do this. 
And you really want to feel that. Feel as if you can do this. That takes a while, particularly if it's a, one of those pesky beliefs that you have about yourself, like really strong belief that you have about yourself. Then it takes a while to feel the opposite. Like, oh, I don't know who I am anymore. Damn it. I knew it so well a few years ago, but now I don't. Now, how does it feel like to go into the role of, oh, I know very well who I am. I just simply am. And that is pretty much, that's enough. I am. The who is flexible. Could be anything. But the I am is very reliable. It's always the same. And so you try on that belief, that, that new kind of identification with something else, another different thought. Yeah, I know very well what I need to do. My personal example is that um, for a while I forgot a lot of things. I always forgot the keys in the house or I forgot... Uh, a little bit of paperwork in my office and all that kind of stuff. And Panji would always point that out. She would always say, like, you forgot, I forgot it again. And then out ah, there again, you forgot something. You forgot it again. Don't you forget this again. When you come back to the resort next time, then please bring this and don't you forget it. And then, of course, I forgot again coming to the resort and she was, you forgot again. Are you okay? Maybe you need some rest. Maybe you're stressed. Like, no, I'm not stressed. How could I ever be stressed? It's not possible, right? Wink, wink. <laughs> and so, my memory went downhill with the self-talk and feeling it being confirmed until one day I, I realized what's going on. And then I told Pan, please stop telling me that I'm forgetting things. But each time I remember something, I want you to talk. Don't say anything when I forget anything. Don't say nothing, I told her. And I also uh, told that to myself, not to say anything if I forget something, but when I remember something, I would say it. Oh, I remembered. And I told Pam, please tell me also, oh, Toby, you remembered that. And please remember to bring that to the resort later on. How will you remember it? I had to picture myself remembering it. And it, at first it felt weird, like almost some sort of like a lie. Yeah, but I'm a forgetful person. That's a belief. I'm actually quite forgetful. Might be the beginning stages of Alzheimer. Do you get it at 34? Is that, is that possible? Well, maybe it's in the family. Oh my God, oh my God. It's already going downhill, you know. And so the belief reaffirms itself and couples with fear. And then it becomes very powerful, very strong, very convincing. And then the opposite belief, like, oh, I remembered that. It feels almost like, ah, oh, come on, but you forgot 10 other things and you remembered only one. Fantastic. It feels like there's this inner sarcasm. Oh, you're so great. You remembered one thing. Fantastic. Feels like a lie. And you need to keep going. Pretend you're really good at remembering something. Challenge your old belief. See it from a different perspective. Ask others about you. Maybe you think you're not handsome enough. Don't stay alone with that belief. Ask someone else. Like, honestly, do you think I'm handsome? Or not? Just be honest. <laughs> It's a weird question to ask sometimes, but it's a nice way to challenge your belief. Post it on Facebook, guys, please, am I handsome? <laughs> and see what, the rep what replies you will get. Oh, it challenges. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then usually the belief kicks back in and says, ah, these people just pity me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're just nice, yeah. We all know that I'm not handsome, yeah. You're very 
yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I know you're joking, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so see, this is the way the belief works. Yeah, it always finds a way around, and you know, kind of justifies the itself again, even if it's disproved. It will kind of find a way of making that. No, no, it's actually that was just fluke, or yeah, we were just lucky, and they don't really mean it. Challenge it and challenge it a lot. And challenge it by the way you feel. Because you can change your feeling. Your feelings are flexible. You can change the way you feel about things. This is easy because feelings are flexible. They're not predetermined. You don't have to feel a certain way. You could also feel differently. Instead of complaining about uh, there being extra mats in front of you, you can also feel happy about there being a fan or you're in a nice room or you're together with nice people. It's perspective. It's just a little change. It changes the way you feel. So challenge your belief like that. And then the fourth and final way, which is super important, act according to the new belief. The action is really important. If you say just, yeah, you know, ah, I'm actually handsome, but then you don't act upon it which is difficult with the handsome thing, maybe something else, like uh, public speaking or something. I, I can't public speak. I can't talk in front of people. Then act in some way, do something to get you to the point to disprove your old belief by yourself, by your own action, not just by the way you feel, but by the way you act. And then the thing is repeat, repeat, repeat. And for some people, of course, it has to be said also that their beliefs are so strong and so overwhelming, they wouldn't even question. They're just unhappy. They don't know why, they don't question it, they're just unhappy, which are a lot of people. But for many of those people, there comes a point, a breaking point, where they either decide to do something about it, and then really start doing something about it, or, you know, go in another way. Just become even more passive. Start drinking, or associate with people who pull them even down more, who confirm what they feel about themselves even more. One fantastic way of challenging the way you feel about yourself is to surround yourself with successful people in the area where you want to be successful. Let's say you want to be a great meditator. The challenge then would be to surround yourself with meditators who are really much better than you. That serves as an inspiration. It really shakes you in your comfort zone. It really makes you feel, okay, I think I can do this. Because they can. Why not me? And the longer you associate with such people, the longer you will also adopt their belief systems. They just kind of, you download them. You hang out with the right people. Is, this is kind of the, the foundation of the path. This is the entire path. The Buddha himself actually said, uh, right company is the entire path. If we associate with the Buddha calls them like a vala is the, the Pali word, like a fool. If we associate with fools, our actions and our habits can become alike. Just naturally, slowly, easily. It doesn't take any effort. If you want to be like a great chef, you want to be hanging around great chefs. Right? That's the way it works. Want to be a good meditator? Hang around good meditators. Seek out that kind of company. It will challenge you in your beliefs in such a strong way. I think the strongest kind of challenge that I've ever seen in my entire life is my meditation master, my teacher. Being around him feels very much like being around a fire, being very close to a fire. If you get too close, you burn yourself. If you just always hang around your teacher, you know, in my case, I feel like it's unbearable because it just shows me so much where I'm in my own way, it's just too painful. They act like mirrors. 
he doesn't do anything much. But I just see myself so strongly in his, in his presence. It's unbearable. So I seek a little bit of distance, then it's nice and warm. Not too close, not too far, because then I would freeze. But always just at the right distance, until I got my own fire going. Then you need to kindle the flames and make sure that it stays alive. So again, just to summarize that one first step to limiting beliefs is making them conscious. Either sit with them or write it down. Take your time to actually study yourself. Make it a 21-day challenge if you like. Study yourself. Look at what kind of limiting beliefs come up during the day. Limiting thoughts that you have about yourself. You probably know them. What are your top three limiting thoughts about yourself? Where do you keep holding yourself back? Right. Second stage is once you know them, then know them as what they are. That it's just a belief that you're having. And make that very, very clear. Belief is a very flexible thing. It's been conditioned. It has its causes. It's subject to change. It's impermanent. It's not really a solid thing. You're not born with it. You've learned it some point later, so you can unlearn it. That's what that points to. This is the freedom, right? The third stage, uh, you want to notice how it feels like when you adopt another belief, a different one, one that you would consider more conducive to success, whatever that means for you. Here on our spiritual path, of course, it refers to meditation. How could you design your meditation sessions more successfully? better but it also is valid for life anything in life instead of complaining about a broken relationship what what is it that you really want can you in fact feel like someone that accomplishes what they want easily it will help and fourth is that you follow through with action that is in accordance with the new belief that's the way how to challenge or let go of all limiting beliefs, how to reprogram your mind, restructure yourself. And like everything, it takes work, it takes consistency, and that means that you have to be important for yourself. You have to feel like, my happiness is something that is important to me. So important so, that I want to act that it doesn't stay just some ideology in your head, but you feel it's so important that you want to do something about it. And it's not just wanting to do something about it, but you actually do something about it. If it comes to that level, you're fine. And then you're already on a learning and growing path. Then every day just adds on to the next as a progression, not as the same old, same old every day. So this is all that comes to mind for today. Are there any questions?